Hi, this is Lynn Hunter, L-L-Y-N-H-U-N-T-E-R, and this is continuation of a, an ink drawing that I did of a Pygmy Slow Loris, and today we're going to uh, continue and paint the drawing that we started. And uh, I'm not sure how many colors that I'm going to be using this time. I to keep trying to use as few colors as possible um, just because it's easier for you guys if you're starting to watercolor paint to just get a few colors instead and then build up your palette. And I know that because um, watercolors, good ones can run you anywhere from six to... Uh, I have a spider running across my painting. There it goes. Uh, sorry about that. Just saying, let me blow this little guy away. <sighs> there we go. He'll find somewhere else in the house to, to eat little insects or what have you. I, I don't kill spiders. I'm, I'm a big friend of spiders. I like them a lot. But anyways, um, I will put a list of which colors I used in the description below. But I do try to use a minimum of colors just because... Um, Okay, he came back. I wonder if he's got a, if he left a trail. Um, okay, he definitely does not want to go away. He's quite, that's too funny. I have this little spider while we're, we're painting today. I may be interrupted regularly by a spiderling. It's hilarious. I just blew him away twice and he came back. So, so much for live video. Anyways, um, this particular painting, I'm going to start out with Payne's Gray. The Pygmy Slow Loris is a nocturnal animal. And so I want to give the background um, a night quality to it. So I'm starting with Payne's Gray. And I'm going to do the background. And the technique we're using today is wet on dry. The paper is dry and the paint is wet. So it's known as wet on dry. Um, sometimes I will add wet into wet, so where the paint might be wet, um, I will sometimes add some color to it. Like right now, I'm painting um, the edge. The edge of this I've put down, this is Scotch Magic Tape. Ma Scotch Magic Tape makes the most amazing frisket. If you need an instantaneous frisket, a frisket is a mask that has adhesive on the back that um, blocks out what you're painting in watercolor. And sometimes it's a, um, like rubber cement can be a frisket. Um, this particular um, Scotch Magic Tape makes great frisket that you can cut easily with an X-Acto knife blade. And it won't, won't adhere heavily to the paper and it peels away very nicely. I use it to um, mask off my paintings, whether they're acrylic or watercolor, and adhere them to a backing board so that the watercolor does not come up. And right now I'm using it as an edge on this painting. I've, I've used it to tape down to, I've, I've just got this taped down on a piece of regular corrugated cardboard. Um, if I were doing a larger painting, I would probably put it down on a chipboard or what I like to use is, believe it or not, the back side of a canvas board because they're cheap. It's The canvas is wrapped around chipboard. The chipboard is made more substantial by the canvas on the chipboard and it makes a really good, um, inexpensive uh, backing board for your watercolors. And if so, if I'm doing like a nine by 12, usually I, I, I re really go bigger than nine by 12, um, just because I like to do detailed things and it's easier to do detailed things smaller. This particular piece I'm working on right now is a four by six. It's also easier to see in video when I do the smaller pieces. I, I've been doing a couple of the larger nine by 12s on video as well. And for some reason, you know, because of the resolution and what have you, I don't think they're as nice for you to see as a demonstration as the smaller pieces. Also, these smaller pieces 
um, will only take anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour to fully paint or fully draw. The um, Slow Loris took a full hour for the drawing primarily because I did both the pencil and the ink work on the same uh, video. So it came out to be about an hour. If you want to see that one, uh, go back and see it before so that you look at that before you see the painting of this. Um, it's a nice little piece and it shows you the way I work for drawing, for both setting up a drawing and setting up uh, the ink work. Now right now what I'm doing, I'm stippling the paint. Okay, you can see I'm giving the background a little bit more weight to this side. It's going to be more of a background shape so it's the dark color won't fill the entire background but I want to give a sense of either twilight or night again because this particular creature you're never going to see out during the day. Those great big eyes it has is because it is a nocturnal animal and it feeds um, on fruits, vegetables, and insects, and small birds. Um, it's a primate and most primates do have a very wide diet. So um, this one in particular lives in Vietnam. Uh, I've also put a link down at the bottom of the description so if you want to look up more on um, the pygmy slow loris you can look it up. There are a lot of lorises that are not endangered. They might be threatened. Um, some of them are actually, I don't think any of them are common just because most primates in general are not common. Um, but I know for a fact that the, uh, the pygmy slow loris is on the endangered species list and here comes my spiderling. I'm going to blow him away. Nope, he's walking away. Very funny to have a spiderling on your desk. Um, but anyways, so we're going to, we're doing primarily in Payne's Gray. I put a little bit of Mars Black um, right here to give a little bit of variety and a feeling of something else in the background. And again, with all watercolor you want to build up, I never go straight to a flat color immediately. Um, it's always a build up with me with watercolor. It allows me to um, make mistakes and uh, I just, I think in terms of build up. So it's one of the reasons why I like a transparent medium over an opaque medium. Opaque mediums work backward. You start with usually your medium value and you work to the light and you work to the dark. Whereas with watercolor, you really don't have a choice. You have to start light and keep building and building and building. But the nice thing about that is with every layer of color that you put down, you get a variety more color than you probably would have chosen in the first place. So you get some colors that the paint chooses because when the water blends the colors together, you, it make, creates values and... Um, textures and colors that you would have never chosen yourself. And so the, the water beco color becomes like your partner and you've got to let it do its own thing. And if you're willing to be adventurous and allow the paint to take over, um, you'll be much more relaxed with watercolor rather than, you know, having to force getting the exact color you want. If you need exacting colors, watercolor may not be the medium for you because you're never going to get exactly what you intended. Uh, it's always going to be something a little bit different and usually um, I find that the paint gives me everything that I want. Now you notice I'm doing all the stippling around the edges here. It's a combination of giving it some texture and interest. Whenever you add um, little texture to the painting, texture adds interest. Okay, so that's that's our, our basic background there. Now I'm going to throw the undercoat on this kid is a little bit of a red color. So I'm going to throw in uh, Burnt Sienna as a shadow color all around. And this is a technique I like to use sometimes is to 
uh, tint the shadows whereas where I think a shadow is going to be or where I want to darken a color in the future like the leaves are going to be green here but burnt sienna is a really nice rusty brown it has a lot of red in it and um, it's really nice when you're putting um, green leaves down to have your shadows go into the red to have them go into the complement and that's why I really like burnt sienna as as a, a nice undertone it also gives it um, a bit of an antiquing kind of in reverse when you antique something you'll do something in bright colors and then you'll throw um, a different color on the top of it like usually an antiquing will be with a, a black or it'll be with a brown and it'll um, fall into the cracks of like when if you're antiquing um, a, um, a piece of ceramics um, or uh, something that's three-dimensional but with um, painting it's kind of you do it in the reverse you throw your antiquing you know where where the cracks are where, where where's the the light going to go in disappear into the cracks that's where you, you'll put it on where there there will be a shadow and so then when you put the color on top of that it may not actually end up being the shadow I usually like to throw purple in as my shadows or again Payne's Gray I, I love to use Payne's Gray you can tell in the, the background there Payne's Gray is is a bluish gray and it comes off when you paint Payne's Gray it'll come up anywhere from a gray to a blue and it's why it's one of my favorite colors to use in a painting and so right now like I said I'm, we're, we're putting all the uh, burnt sienna though in these areas and then now he's got the um, Solaris itself um, where it's got the uh, it's got various portions on its Ooh, that was good <laughs> juggling with the brush um, but uh, the the red it has um, red accents in its hair so I'm gonna put the red in, in the accents down first and what will happen is is that I'll go over this with some probably um, um, raw sienna or burnt, si burnt sienna I'm sorry not burnt sienna um, umber I'm working with um, burnt sienna right now sorry my apologies burnt sienna is the red um, umber is yellow umber comes out much more yellow and so I'm putting down the reds first because also red is darker than yellow um, when it comes to uh, hues you want to be sparing with the red if you want to um, make your yellow brighter and what will happen is, is that also um, burnt sienna will dissolve nicely um, so what it'll do is when I put the uh, um, probably I'm going to use raw umber over the burnt sienna it'll dissolve the burnt sienna just enough where it'll start blending with the uh, the raw sienna or excuse me the raw umber when I paint over it and then if I want to go darker with the red again with the uh, there's my spider little spiderling just adventurous on my painting today I said I blew him away twice and he just keeps coming back I mean, I'll assume he's he's putting down a drop line or something or I just not not blowing him far enough away I have a lot of spiders in my house I, I live in the woods in uh, Central Coast California so if you live in a forested area in Central Coast California you are going to have cellar spiders everywhere they I basically shoo them out of the house about once every um, couple of months I'll, I'll do the three to four month okay take my there's it's called a Webster and you go through the the ceiling of your house and you just kind of evacuate all the spiders and get rid of all their webs and they all come back again because they think you're you're the interior of your house is the inside of a tree and so as far as they're concerned you're just one big tree and the one thing they do do is they do keep away a lot of mosquitoes 
they keep away roaches. We don't have any problem with roaches at all here. It's like, any baby roaches in this house? No, the cellar spiders will get them right away. And they, they're a little bit annoying, but there's, you know, not much you can do about them. You live with the spiders. And also Central Coast is the land of spiders. This little guy, I have no idea what he is. We have jumping spiders. We have orb weavers. We've got just about any spider you can imagine. We have got some variation of them on the Central Coast. But anyways, this is, this is about lorises, not spiders. Um, what's really interesting, found out about this um, recently, the loris is the only poisonous mammal. I mean, literally venomous. It has, it has a poison. If you get bitten by a loris, you can get very sick and die. I, could, I did not believe this. It's like, seriously, look it up. Look, look up information on the loris. They have glands in their hands, like their wrists, and they coat their teeth with the venom that's from the, the, these glands in their wrists. And if they bite you, they can kill you. <laughs> And I'm assuming it's it's something they use to, you know, get their prey or what have you. Um, but it is also a defense mechanism. So it's, it's like these cute little fun primates. Basically, they're relative to monkeys. These guys are related to us. They are primates. Monkeys. Technically, they, they look very rodentia, but they're not. But then again, um, if you did not know, you're also closely related to rodentia. As, as the evolution ladder goes, it goes from rodentia to primate. So the thing is, is that the reason why, this is nice little factoid, the reason why they can use rats and mice as um, creatures that we used to experiment with medicine rather than monkeys. They still use monkeys and apes, but they can use rats and mice because they have very short lifespans. But they, I think it's something like 89% of mouse DNA is the sim similar to you and me. And so the thing is, is that primates are the next one. So it goes rodentia, then primates, basically rats and mice, then monkeys and monkey-like critters, and then you and I. So these are these are our closest these are some of our closest relatives right here. The um, slow this um, pygmy slow loris has five toes, and it on its hands and its feet. Okay, now right now I'm going into the green. This green was made with hunter's green, light, and a little bit of cad yellow. Um, I have a tendency to choose most of my colors um, to the warm side. I usually have, um, of the six colors in a color wheel, I will have a warm and a cool version of each of the colors on my palette. And that way I can, I can get mixed just about any color there is. When you have a warm and a cool, and you have a warm and a cool Excuse me, the phone is ringing. I forgot to unplug it. I'm just going to let it ring. My apologies. It's like, there's always one thing like that that I forget. My, my biggest one, if you didn't realize, in a couple of my past videos, I have, I have one chair that's extremely squeaky. And... Uh, It'll leave a squeak occasionally when I'm, I'm adjusting my, where I'm sitting. But anyways, this, like I said, this is hooker's green mixed with just a wee bit of cad yellow because the hooker's green straight out of the tube is, was not, um, yeah. Apologies there. <laughs> I'm having all kinds of telephone fun today. Probably something I'm need needing to pick up too, but not right now. Anyways, my apologies. 
I'm going to finish this up pretty fast. Again, this is Hooker's Green and Cad Yellow for the bottom. I will um, probably I'll throw a little bit of purple into the shadows and a little extra yellow in the top. But right now we're just dealing with um, a small mixture of Hooker's Green and Cad Yellow together. And you can see too, can you see now how that, that Burnt Sienna is bleeding into the green? So it's, it's getting a little bit um, mushy. I don't know how... Mushy is not quite the right word, but it, it's, it's dissolving it when the... Uh, I hit it with the green that's wet on not quite 100% dry. It's like this is really dry here, so it won't dissolve as much. But if I scumble, if I'm, I'm painting so that I scumble a bit, or scumbling is when you take your brush and you, you run it over a wet area of paint, because what that does is that, that shifts the pigment that's underneath. So the thing is, is where some, you'll see some where the areas where the line looks solid and some where it's, it's faded and, as I said, went mushy. So that, that you have this blending of color d here and it'll lighten up the brown. Whereas like here, it was more dry so you can see more of the line. Okay, now I'm going to paint the branches and I'm going to give the branches... I'm going to actually do the branches in a light burnt sienna underneath. Give it a real light burnt sienna. Because I want them to go a little bit dark, and I want to give them a bit of a red color. The um, branches that he's are on are like a combination of burnt sienna and gray, and that's kind of what I want to do too. I'm using a photograph to paint this particular image, and I'm sorry that I can't show you the photographs that I'm using as reference tools for this because technically they're copywritten material. And if I show the reference material that I'm using or that I'm looking at, it's one thing for me to look at it while I'm drawing. That's not infringing on any kind of copyright. That's just, it's a visual reference. If I show it to you in a video, then I'm breaking copyright. And there, the photographer's copyright will have technically been infringed on by my using his um, image to show you what I am doing. So I know this is tricky stuff, but you know, you don't want to, if you can, not infringe on, on another person's rights. But also, the thing is, is that this guy has posted on the internet. It's something that I am allowed to use as a visual reference, you know, as long as I'm not, even if I'm tracing over it, it's technically, it's altered enough where it's not really. Um, his image anymore it then becomes my image and I've adjusted is that his image or her image um, did not have legs on it um, this particular image was only from the waist from about this portion here to um, down here and then there the background is basically something out of my imagination totally that's something that I've worked up myself. Um, so the thing is, is what I'm doing here is technically an amalgamation of another artist's work. Okay, now the Loris is um, technically white down near his feet and he's got kind of a cream underbelly. Now what I'm doing right now, this color that I'm using right now is raw sienna. I've used burnt sienna as red and, um, oh, I took that back. This is, this is raw umber. My apologies. This is raw umber. That's why it's more yellow. But I'm going to trip you guys all up. Um, but this is raw umber. Raw umber Umber itself is a yellowish brown, whereas sienna is a red brown. So like I said, with my colors, I like to go to a warm and a cool. With the browns, it's good to have a red and yellow, red, yellow, and blue brown. My, um, my red brown is sienna my yellow brown is umber and then um the uh, blue brown is sepia and you can use all those browns together to come up with a variety of color too uh, and with all color it's always experimentation and play 
you'll find one of my favorite color combinations um, to work with with liquid acrylic is um, using a very intense um, pink or um, usually it's it's um, I'm trying to think of the, the it's like rose matter it's not quite it would be a lizard and crim it would be a li an alizarin and crimson in watercolor I don't think it's called that in uh, um, liquid acrylics but I use that with a very blue green and those two colors together when you mix this pink with this very blue green you get an intense a variety of purples and blues and so the thing is is that that's only with the liquid acrylic this is Schmenka um, that that will work it does work a little bit with watercolors watercolors will tend to get muddy with certain colors when you mix them and it's really an experimentation now I'm gonna dab this a bit because there we go because what that's that dabbing it with paper towel you can tell I pulled out some of the color to lighten it up and it also will give it a little texture um, because this this particular uh, creature is a little bit butterscotchy so when I was laying down the um, raw umber um, it was a little bit too intense so I wanted to give it a little bit of more of the butterscotchy color so I just picked out the color with my uh, paper towel okay now I'm gonna go back into the leaves because again I want I want uh, the color that I'm working on in there to dry just a little bit I'm gonna go back into the leaves with um, a little bit of Prussian blue because Prussian blue is more of a dye and it's very transparent but it's very intense and it works beautifully on greens to get them more of a blue green and it's more of a transparent so I'm going to give these the shadows on this one more of a Prussian blue this is all Prussian blue that I'm putting on here it looks green just because it's transparent and it's giving it's a, almost a turquoise if you get if you um, pull Prussian green uh, sorry Prussian blue straight out of the tube it's a very um, turquoise blue but it's a very pure and transparent blue so I like it for for getting my dark greens um, because it doesn't leave a lot of residue and it gives that nice intense um, blue green with the the yellow green on top and then too see it's mixing you've got again the uh, burnt sienna underneath will give you that nice the shadow is going both red and blue at the same time so you've almost got an added purple in there with the Prussian blue and that's a little bit intense there so I'm gonna pull that out that was a little bit dark um, and the thing is is that when you're doing something if something gets too dark sometimes you can pull it back by using just a brush filled with straight water and then scumble on your dark area and that'll pull the paint out it all depends on what kind of color that you've used if you've used a, um, a dye color it won't come out as easily as with a pigment color and it won't none of it will go straight back to white if you want something to go back to white you have to literally um, pick it out with an exacto knife blade and you can do that I mean don't think about making a hole in your paper thinking about scraping it away like you would with sandpaper okay what I'm doing right now is I'm putting a, a little coat of Payne's gray over that burnt sienna I painted on the trigs and then I'm pulling it out because I basically want both the uh, Payne's gray and the burnt sienna to come through but I don't want one to overpower the other and I'm kind of letting the paper decide which is more intense where so I'm laying down the Payne's gray over the burnt sienna and then I'm pulling it out and you see how that you still see a little Payne's Gray, you see a little Burnt Sienna, and it's kind of a mix. Now, I haven't put a shadow on this branch yet. I'm just worrying about the color at the present. 
So I'm just putting the Payne's Gray on top of the burned sienna to give it a stain. So I'm, like I said, just putting it down and picking it up. And you'll see that the, the, the burnt sienna is still there and the Payne's Gray is still there, and it's to varying degrees. And it also will pick up in the um, all the uh, the shadows on this little guy I'm going to be doing in Payne's Gray. And probably, I'm not sure if I want to throw some purple in there yet or not. I always like to put a little either blue or purple in the shadows sometimes. But right now, I'm, I'm when you're painting, it's like you make your color decisions as you paint. Okay. Now this little guy, he's got, now you can tell most of this, this area in here has dried by now. While I've been out painting the leaves, most of the area in here has gotten dry enough for me to go back in and not worry too much about bleeding. There'll be some because he's, he's got um, really gr gray around the eyes and it's even lighter than that. So I'm going to take the, I've loaded up my brush. I've cleaned it out with water and I've just loaded it up with water and I'm trying to take this back just a little bit. Yeah, that's better. Sometimes it works, sometimes you get where you want it to and sometimes it doesn't. But he's got this the, like these little gray outlines around his eyes. So I'm using the Payne's Gray to do that. And like I said, Payne's Gray itself is not really gray. It's it's like a blue gray. Okay. And he's got a little bit blue here and underneath his fur here. Give him some shadow. And his, he's got more of a, a blue black. So I'm using just a little um, Mars black into the Payne's gray, just to take it a little bit more gray. Now that's too dark there. I want it just a little light. So I'm going to dab that off. And do the same thing over here. Because he's got, he's really light, you know, and I don't want to go too dark. Mind you, watercolor always, when you're laying it down, will dry lighter than you paint it. And it's, it really is a matter of after a while, after you've um, painted a few paintings, you get a feeling for how dark it's going to be. And the thing is, is that you can always go darker when the painting's totally dry. If you find there's an area that you just it went too light, you can always go back in and go darker. Um, it's tough to get it lighter. You can do it. Like I said, you can go in with wa um, with both water and scumble it out, or you can go in with uh, um, a blade and pick it out. But it's always best if you can, you know, just build up. And you can tell it doesn't take that long to build up. Okay, cool. That's looking good. And I'm going to put just a little itty bitty pit a very, very diluted alizarin crimson in his ears. And just a little bit of pink in there. And because he does have a little pink in there. And then I'm going to take another little bit of the gray and give him some edging around his fur. And there's, um, the fur has this really teddy bear quality to it. So I'm scumbling in, this is Payne's gray again, to give him a little bit of that, that teddy bear fur here. And he's got a little bit of gray around his fingertips. And again, even though it's Payne's gray behind him as well, because this is a much lighter Payne's gray, it's going to be more of a harmonizing with the background than blending into the background. And the other thing is, is when I'm totally done with this, I will, I won't show it on this particular video, but I will go over the ink drawing one more time um, when I'm done with painting to crispen up the edges or where the, the paint's showing through where I didn't want it to. Um, you can widen the line a bit, but um, I will go over the ink drawing once again after the painting's done. Okay. 
Now I'm going to throw, let me see here. I'm going to throw a little bit. I'm trying to think what I want to do with those shadows. I'm going to mix a little bit of Payne's Gray and um, the uh, Prussian Blue together to darken it up. And I'm going to use that for the shadows. So in the, uh, the twig here. And that's a little dark, so yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna lay it down and then I'm gonna pick it out. Because you can see right now there's like about there's too much pigment in there. Um, and right now it's drying real fast. There hasn't not enough water in there and it's too much pigment. So I laid down water on top of that and then I'm picking it out. There. And then when that dries, it'll dry even a little lighter. Because I wanna get I wanna turn the branch. You know, it's not like we're, I'm trying to get a night feel, but we want to get the feeling of turning the branch too. So you want to give a core shadow like underneath. Okay, I had some de technical difficulties on this one between a spider walking across the painting, telephone call, and me turning on the camera and off again, you've missed half the painting. My apologies, and I've been sitting here telling you so many neat things, and we've missed this one on this one, but here we have the finished painting. Um, I've just um, finished painting the eyes. The eyes are still wet. The nose is still wet. Again, my apologies for what you've missed on this. Um, what I want to show you is I've used Scotch Magic Tape to tape this piece down, and I want to show you how to remove it. When you're removing spot, Scotch pa Magic Tape, you'll take take the edge and you pull it off at a right angle. So you're pulling, you can see there's a right angle here and I'm pulling it off very carefully. And you can see it's, act, it's acted as a frisket. So anywhere where I painted the background over the Scotch Tape, it will pull away. Now th again, this particular paper is um, 150 pound or 300 gram Arches hot press watercolor paper. Now I'm going down to this edge. I'm carefully pulling this side away. And again, you pull it. If you pull it off at an angle, you shouldn't have any problem. There will be a little bit of pulling on the paper. There will be a little bit of adhesive left behind. But when the painting is totally done, you just take a, a kneaded eraser to that or a latex eraser and you'll never even know that there was any tape on this particular piece. Now, right at the corner there, there's a little bit of paint that slipped under right here. And I'm going to attack that with an X-Acto knife and clean that up. And you'll never even know that there was a mistake there. And that's the thing with all watercolor. When you're learning to paint with watercolor, what's best is to learn how to fix your mistakes. Again, we're pulling at a right angle across the top, very carefully. Yeah. And you can see it, it'll pull off a little bit. Of, it's pulled off a little bit of paper on the uh, cardboard, but that doesn't matter because that's why it's, we're using cardboard. Now. Let's see if I can show you, since we didn't get to do a lot of painting. Okay, see the those two little mistakes in the corner? I'm going to show you, let's see here, there we go, right there. Yeah, camera, camera, hold where I want you to hold, right there. I'll move. Now I'll move the piece. There we go. There. So you can see the mistakes that are there. And I'm going to take an exacto knife blade. See? Exacto knife blade. And we're just going to. I sometimes um I'll put a little slice right here. Um, let's see, move this around so you can see. Okay, and then I'll take it and just scrape it. And I seem to have d done some ink work over here. And see, I'm just scraping it very, and it looks like, just like 
using sandpaper. And there, it's gone. And you've scraped it down to the paper. You can, once you take your kneaded eraser or latex eraser off that and remove the extra little fibers there, you can paint over that and it'll be like nothing ever happened. Now one last thing on this particular piece. Um, I want to uh, put a little bit more burnt sienna and just a touch, mixed with just a touch of um, Payne's Gray to give him a shadow over here under where the highlight is. And I made a mistake on this one right here. Okay, what I want to do here did just the opposite. I'm going to lift up some of that red that I put down. And you do that, you can see how I can lift up just a little bit of the paint by putting down, this is just water, water in my brush, putting it down where the eye was and lifting that up. And I can do the same thing over here. This is just straight water. And you clean your brush out so that it's just water again. Yeah, got to drop in there. So there's just water in this brush. And I'm scumbling it on where the burnt sienna was. And then I'm emptying the water out of my brush, totally out of my brush. I'm drying it on a paper towel. And then the brush acts like Okay, I had technical difficulties again. Um, I was showing you how to pull off the tape after painting the eyes, and my apologies, it didn't come through. <laughs> but I wanted to wrap up this, this piece, finally. We'll do better next time. I'm still learning how to do video. Um, thank you for putting up with me. Thank you for stopping by. I really appreciate this. And I hope that what I'm doing for you is at least entertaining. Hopefully you learn something. Hopefully you enjoy what I'm doing. Uh, again, it's Lynn Hunter, L-L-Y-N-H-U-N-T-E-R. There's all kinds of information down below concerning my Patreon, where you can find more information about the Pygmy Slow Loris, and what materials you might want to use for a painting like this. Again, my apologies on this particular video. I think there's some good things in it, um, but I wanted to wrap it up. Thank you so much for stopping by. Please subscribe. Please like the video. Really appreciate your being here. Thanks much. Bye-bye.